it was in jail that um, I actually found Christ. I, I, I was finally at the end in our, in our jail cells, women would be doing little Bible studies and whatnot. And I'd be like, oh, well, I guess I'll just join in here. Um, and, and one day I just remember opening up the word and it, and I was like, God, if, if this is, you know, if this is real, cause that's what we were allowed to have in jail. You had a book and you had your Bible. Um, and I, I was like, if you're real, like show me, like I need, I, I don't know what to do. And I opened up the Bible and it was to Isaiah 54 and I read it and it was, I, I can't even, it was a complete like change. Like those words were for me. That was what he was speaking to me. And that veil of had been completely removed. I, and that was where my, my come, my come to Jesus moment was. Hello and welcome to Calvary Conversations. My name is Sean LePage. I'm the chairman of the ministry studies department here at Calvary University. And I'm very pleased today to bring you the second half of a conversation that uh, I started last week with Tim Challey, Kelly Bolin, and Richard Barham. And uh, so, so Tim is a graduate of Calvary University, and Kelly and Richard are current students of Calvary University. Um, and all of them have a history in uh, addiction recovery, in helping people uh, who are who have gone through some type of addiction. In fact, Kelly and Richard themselves uh, were addicts, and uh, we shared their story uh, last week. And so, if you if you didn't get a chance to to hear their stories, I encourage you to go find that episode and and uh, listen to Kelly and Richard talk about how Jesus Christ radically transformed them, and they are now actually helping other addicts. To uh, escape the uh, the uh, the power and the, uh, the the devastation of addiction. So let's now go to the second half of our conversation, where we explored some of the ways the biblical worldview can impact uh, someone who is either uh, facing addiction themselves or trying to help someone uh, escape that addiction. So how does how has, I mean, um, Richard and Kelly, you both uh, have a testimony of coming to Christ uh, out of your addiction. I mean, my my perception in, in, in my little experience with this this issue is that that very few people um, put it behind them unless they find Jesus. It, uh, it, you know, uh, so so talk to me about say the development of the biblical worldview and and your identity as a Christian as a person in Christ as an image bearer with great value in God's sight how does that impact um, the addict and and their uh, identity their their view of themselves I think it starts I, I, I with um, that we're new creations that that when when we come to Jesus when we are at that point where we've exhausted every single option that we had and we look up and I, and I believe God will take crutches away from you like you are called you are chosen and he he needs to get you into a place to where you can look up and stop looking outward um when he calls you and as you start to walk with him we've got to challenge our thinking how knowing who I am, like, but we still have to work through all of the stuff. That doesn't mean that stuff goes away. We have to work through it and we have to challenge that thinking. We have, you know, that once an addict, always an addict. Um, if I'm, if I'm running off of that addict mentality, then my behaviors are going to be like an addict. I, I, I need to, to take those thoughts captive. I need to look at them. I need to challenge them and see where my views of God my views of others and the views of myself are. And I have to choose to accept it or change it. And if God brings it to my attention that I need to change it, then I need to change it because that's my responsibility. That's great. Um, uh, it seems to line up perfectly with what Richard was saying, that it's that it's mental. And, and, and you talk about, you know, uh, I think that's 2 Corinthians, to, uh, taking our thoughts captive um, uh, Richard, I mean, do, do you agree? I mean, how, how uh, same question for you is, you know, how, how has your, your growing development of a biblical worldview of who you are in Christ, how has that affected, you know, your identity 
as a as a person and as an as a former addict or a, as mm -hmm. a as someone who's been addicted to to drugs and alcohol in the past um i think I, your your perception of yourself or your identity as you see it is is essential in changing your behaviors and and just how you see yourself like i was falsely accused of a crime and i was in jail like i said for four months <clears throat> and while i was in there i would study christian books and the bible and one day i saw a handwritten note and it said ask god what he thinks of you and i had this idea of myself as this homeless junkie thief you know that my life didn't matter that what i did didn't matter that you know, I'm just one out of seven billion people and I don't really mean anything, you know. Well, I, I saw this note and I was going to court that day and I just started praying and I said, God, what do you, what do you think of me? And like this little song started playing in my mind and it said, you're courageous and loving and giving and you love me and you're pure of heart and meek. And as this song was playing in my mind, I had these visions from my life of times when I was courageous or when I showed love for God or, you know, and not only did it change my view of myself, but it changed my view of God. Cause I had this view that God was up there. Like you let me down this time and you failed me that time. And, and, you know, I'm so disappointed in you. And, you know, that was my perception of God, but this experience showed me not only that God doesn't see me that way, that he sees the good in me and, you know, it changed my perception of who God is and who I am. And, you know, it's like if you if you think you're nothing but a lousy drunk, you're going to be a lousy drunk, you know. And if you say you're born a, a prince and you're going to be king one day and you live your life on that premise, you know. So if you have this idea of yourself as well, you know, all I'm ever going to be is a lousy drunk, then that's what you're going to be. But if you can see yourself as a child of God, you're going to live in that way. Amen. You know, I think it's awesome, you know, that that song came into your head. And, and you know, one of the things to think about uh, as you were talking about that is that, you know, often um, when I have counseled people, you know, to get into the word and to memorize scripture, it's often um, not received well because. I think people hear me and counselors saying, you know, just memorize scripture and everything will be all right. It's like a magic bullet. But, but Tim, am I right that it, that it, uh, it, we, we, we counsel people to get into the word because of this, because it gives them a, a, a better picture of reality and, and how God views them and, and who they are and, and their own value and so forth. Is that, is that an accurate way to, to, to describe that? Absolutely. Um, I, I use, in our program, we use scripture memorization as part of that, those stepping stones to exactly what Richard and Kelly were, were talking about. You know, one of the things I did and is I would give my cell phone number to people who were in our ministry. And I would say, you call me any hour, any day, night, whenever. If you need help, I am here. I would get a call on fr you know, Friday, Saturday night, 1130 and say, Tim, this is so-and-so. I'm going to go get high. And I would say, no, you're not. Let's pray together. Let's recite some of the verses that we memorized together. Let's go to the throne of grace and see if, and the, those verses would come to mind and we would focus on those. And then the person I'm talking to would say, thank you, Tim. I'm going to go home, go to bed. And I say, praise the Lord. So it's the memorization of verses that become a, the tool and the, the knowledge of God that turns into faith that we can use then to replace that addiction. It's it's like Kelly was saying, we, we have to take our thoughts captive and, Amen. Amen. and our minds are renewed by the word of God. Right. I mean, that's I love that, I love that passage. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Kelly and Richard, I, I want to get your your thoughts on uh, something very closely related. So I, I I shared a little bit of my own experience as, a, as someone who's counseled people about, you know, getting the word of God in their minds and in their hearts. Um, but what are some of the some of the ways that, um, you know, when you were going through your own uh, addiction experience, what are what are some of the uh, things you learned about uh, how the church could do a, a, a better job of 
ministering uh, to people. So let me let me start with the question of, you know, what are some of the common uh, misconceptions within the church about addiction, uh, and then you know h- how are how are some ways that the church can do just a better job of reaching out to and, and ministering uh, to to people experiencing addiction, um, Kelly. I think um, part of part of the addiction ministry that we have at my church is we go to the lost. So we go to the places that that people um, who do, who who don't have Jesus. We'll go sit in any rooms. Um, we you know we work with probation and parole, and and we we get them to um, like send their their information, and we and and there is the opportunity for us to. To be able to to go out and and step in where where Jesus would step in, but I had this really bad distorted view of God. I didn't know I I did I wasn't able to receive the grace and the mercy and the acceptance. I didn't understand that, and I was chasing my addiction, which in its in and itself it isolates. Um, when I came when I when I had gotten into the program and and I remember my first day at church, I was actually like this is where I'm supposed to be. It was actually like lifting, like this weight had been lifted. This is where God wants me. This is, these are now my people. Um, but, um, what I've, I've noticed, um, with some of the, I think the misconceptions is that, um, the, the fear, the fear of addicts. I mean, you hear these really bad stories about, you know, the, uh, I, I, I was a thief. I, I, was I was the one that was running around with um, probably these guys' kids, you know, like and, and not doing good things. And so I think there's a fear. Um, but as as far as what can the church do, I just think it's understanding and and that that worldview, right? That we are all united, whether it's you know some addict that comes in or you know. Um, and has five days clean, but has Jesus, that Jesus is our, our bullseye. That's where it's at. Amen. So, so Kelly, did you say that you, you eventually did go to a church? I did. Um, yes. Uh, uh, and that was that, was that uh, while you were still an addict or was that after you had put it behind you or? No, I was, before I came to Christ, I was like a Paul. <laughs> so I, I mean, I I had um, a really bad misconception of Christians. I I thought I had this. Um, I, the Bible was a book of stories. You know, the the demon possessions. That's epilepsy. Don't you know anything medically? Like I would like it when it came to anything. I was totally against everything that the Bible had. I wouldn't even read it. Um, it was in jail that. Um, I actually found Christ. I, I, I was finally at the end in our, in our jail cells, women would be doing little Bible studies and whatnot. And I'd be like, Oh, well, I guess I'll just join in here. Um, and, and one day I just remember opening up the word and it, and I was like, God, if, if this is, you know, if this is real, cause that's what we were allowed to have in jail. You had a book and you had your Bible. Um, and I, I was like, if you're real, like show me, like I need, I, I don't know what to do. And I opened up the Bible and it was to Isaiah 54 and I read it and it was, I, I can't even, it was a complete like change. Like those words were for me. That was what he was speaking to me. And that veil of had been completely removed. I, and that was where my, my come, my come to Jesus moment was. Amen. And Amen. Uh, when I had gotten out of jail, I went right back to the same stuff that I knew. I didn't have connection. I didn't have fellowship. I, I knew that I believed in in God and that, you know, he was for me. And but when I got out, I didn't have the tools to go a different route. I I mean, I I fell right back into um, my old habits. I kind of think of um, I think it's Proverbs and Peter. That's like it's like a dog going back, going to its returning to its vomit. And that's exactly what I did was was go and return back to the old stuff. Um when I got into the transitional home, one of the requirements in the transitional home is on Sundays, we go to church and we do, we do uh, family dinners. And so when I got into the home, that was my first time going to church. And it was before, um, it wasn't shameful. It wasn't, you know, well, what are they going to think of me? I'm just wearing this big sign on me. 
I didn't feel like that. I felt completely like there was a burden lift. This is where I was supposed to be. And that's still the church that I go to today. Amen. Yeah, I'm really intrigued. You said a little bit ago about this church that you said, these are my people. Is that is that right? Uh, that's right. I'm really intrigued by that. What was it that they did? You know, my question was negative. Where does the church mess up? But your 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 story is that the church did something right. Mm-hmm. What was that exactly? How did they make you uh, feel welcome and, and whatever? What was that? So it was, um, for one, just being in the transitional home and the director um being a part of the church. And so our church really supports the addiction ministry and what's going on at the transitional home. But when I first walked in, I remember my pastor's wife just coming up to me and giving me a hug. And she's just like, I'm so glad you're here. Like, I'm so excited to get to know you. And she was like right by my side throughout, like till now, she's still a really huge part of my life. Um, and in helping to disciple me and getting me into service. And, you know, when I had questions, when I'm like, what does this mean? She's like, well, let's go look it up. Come on, let's go. (laughs) And it was just like, it was a complete opposite. And so I don't, I haven't had a negative experience. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's so exciting to hear. Richard, uh, what about you? Uh, uh, What do you think are some of the misconceptions within the church about Um, addiction? Well, I mean, I think, we still have that like pharisaical attitude in a lot of churches that somehow we're better than the sinners. Mm. You know, that instead of the realization that we're all sinners and we all need Christ, we tend to uh, have degree of sinner, you know, well, I'm not as bad a sinner as this person. And well, look at that person. They're really a sinner. You know, I may sin a little bit, but, that's a real sinner over there, you know? And so I think they tend to shun the very people that we're trying to reach. You know, those are, that's who Jesus went looking for. Amen. You know, he wasn't just hanging out at the synagogue talking about all the sinners downtown. He was downtown. Hey, come on, let's go. You know? And, and I think a lot of churches, we have this, this judgmental attitude of, being better than others and that only the good people are welcome at church, you know? And we, so we put on a, we put on this happy face and this uh, facade and go to church as if we're better than others, you know? And I think, you know, that's always been the, the, the attitude, you know, people still have this works-based attitude that I've done better than this, this person, or when the reality is we're all, desperately in need of Christ. We're all sinners. And even now we're still sinners, you know, (laughs) and the answer is Jesus. You know, it's not being better, looking better, you know, acting like you're better. It's just that, that realization that these are people who are lost and they need Christ and they need his love, you know, and addiction is really a lonely thing because and for good reason, a lot of people's families walk away from them. They get so fed up with the lies and the, and the stealing and the, you know, criminal activities and the, you know, being out all night. And so the families walk away to protect themselves, but then you're leaving the people with the other addicts and, you know, those are their friends, but you realize they're not really your friends. You, they just want to pull you in to with them, you know? Mm. And then, so I think one of the hardest parts about getting clean for me was leaving behind the people that I knew and that I thought I loved, you know, and that I thought loved me. But once you're not doing the things they're doing anymore, they don't really want anything to do with you, you know? Mm. And so you kind of get in this transition where, you're not really, you know, you're not really fitting in with these uh, churchy people, but you're not really fitting in with your other people either, you know. So there's a kind of a transitional phase there that's really difficult. Mm, that's uh, that's valuable. Go ahead, Kelly. Sorry. I, one of the things that I tell the girls all the time um, is the first thing that we have to change is absolutely everything. Because everything that we knew before 
what is is you know product of our past product of the lies it's it's not any we need to to change absolutely everything including who we hang out with and the value of like the support groups you know to have a, a few people that you can learn to be open and to learn to be vulnerable with are huge to, to help you in start to transition out of the old into the new. Kelly, I, I appreciate that. I, I'm, I'm actually uh, well over our normal time here for these programs, uh, but I want to I want to finish in this way. I, I want each of you to to uh, tell me you, you just mentioned that you you say to the girls, uh, to the to the to the young women you're working with um, uh, uh, from each from each one of you, I'd like to hear what you uh, what you say to the person who uh, you come into contact with and either they are addicted or someone they love is addicted, uh, where do you start? What do you say to them? Um, uh, Kelly, since you uh, uh, sparked this idea, uh, why don't you uh, get us going? What do you say to someone? Where do you start um, with someone who's addicted or, or someone they love is addicted? But the opposite of addiction is connection. We need to connect with each other. We need hmm. to connect with others and with God. Okay. Uh, Richard. Um, I had a, a friend that was struggling with alcoholism. And I mean, he just like, he couldn't stop drinking. And I told him, you need to start looking at it as it's as if it's your enemy. It's trying to destroy you. It's trying to kill you. It's trying to take away everything that you have, you know, because we have this tendency to look at it as a comforter or a friend or a, a relief when in reality, it just makes things worse. It's trying to destroy you. It'll, it'll take everything from you and give you nothing back in return. And so I think when you start looking at it in those terms, then you don't want anything to do with it, you know. If you're like, hey, you want to drink a glass of poison? No, no, I'm good. Thanks. You know. <laughs> so you have to you have to, again, change the way you think. Mm -hmm. uh, alcohol is not your friend. It's your enemy. Right. Yeah. Um, good. Well, Tim, close us out here. What do you say? Where do you start? Where I usually started with somebody that would come to me and, and really that was the key. Both both Richard and Kelly, you guys both shared this, that you finally had to go somewhere and, and find something, whether it was a Bible in jail or, or recognizing you had hit bottom. I would sit down with somebody that God had enabled me to talk to and say, you're in bondage. Do you realize that? Do you realize what bondage is? And we'd talk through that. And then I would open up the scriptures and I would usually go to John chapter three and said, you can be free. You can, you can be set free in Jesus Christ. Yeah. It starts right here and right here in the heart and we can then work through your addiction but we need to go from bondage to freedom and w when you t put it in those terms people that are struggling understand that and so i would i would point to the freedom we have in christ not that our problems go away jesus said in this world you're going to have trials and troubles but be of good cheer i've overcome the world and that and that's what i would offer to people okay so i i kind of fibbed i'm going to ask one more question um, and that is this. Um, uh, just uh, imagine uh, the uh, the pastor out there, or the youth pastor, or perhaps a parent, um, or or even uh, someone who is is coming to terms with their own addiction. What is a resource that you would recommend, whether a ministry or a book or a website or or something? What is a what is a, a resource that you would recommend to them that they could? continue this uh, this conversation and, and learn more about uh, how to how to put uh, an addiction behind them or someone that they're ministering to. Um, I I used our program it was again was reformers unanimous and then as also as a counselor I would say can I just spend time with you if I if there's a local church as Richard mentioned celebrate recovery and Kelly you mentioned your ministry there is funnel people into those uh, into those ministries where they can talk to somebody who understands where they're at. Um, we in the church, um, you know, since COVID hit, these ad our addiction recovery ministries have been kind of set aside. I think they're so important. You know, Richard, you're in Colorado Springs. I'm in Castle Rock. I would like to talk to you outside of this discussion. Yeah. And 
let me talk to you, brother. I'd like to find out what you're doing, what I'm doing. Maybe there's something God would have us do together even now. So that's what I would say, Sean. Amazing. Wonderful. Uh, Richard, yeah. is there something that you would recommend to someone? Um, I was going to mention Celebrate Recovery. I think that's a, a good thing. But I wanted to say one thing, too, is, you know, we often think of addiction as the problem when really it's a symptom of a greater problem. Amen. And I think that's one thing that Celebrate Recovery tries to do is they try to get to the root of the problem. You know, the root of the problem is is trauma or shame or guilt or, uh, you know, people who have been neglected or abused. They have this pain within them. And the addiction is just a manifestation of a greater problem. And the, the analogy that I like to use, it's like if you cut your finger. So your finger hurts because you cut it. So you start taking aspirin. And it kills the pain, but you still got this cut. But you never heal the cut. You just keep taking more aspirin. And so the, the, the cut starts getting infected, and it starts getting gangrene, and it gets worse and worse. But you take more and more aspirin, but your finger's just getting worse and worse until you got to cut it off, you know? So if you don't deal with the issue that's causing the addiction – then you're just going to take more and more, you know, and somebody comes along and they say, man, you got a real problem with aspirin. So you start taking, you stop taking the aspirin, but your finger still hurts, you know? <laughs> so you're going to find something else to, to feel that hole, to, you know, kill that pain. And so I think it's important to get to the root of why people are addicted, you know? And, and who helped you do that, Richard? Who, who has best helped you, uh, to get at the root of your own addiction? Um, I mean, I think just God, you know, and showing me that I'm not the person that I thought I was. And, you know, I mean, I had always, uh, I mean, I've gone through some counseling where I've had to deal with things that happened in my childhood and things that happened growing up. And um, I think coming to terms with that and, you know, God said to me one time, he's like, you need to forgive yourself. And I think that was instrumental, too, is, you know, forgiving yourself and accepting God's forgiveness Amen. and God's love, you know. Good, good. Kelly, I'll give you the last word. Is there a resource that you would recommend or just anything else you want to say? Um, absolutely. So um, down here, we don't have like the Celebrate Recovery or the Uform or, or Reformers Unanimous, but we have a, a pure word addiction ministry. Um, so that would be some place that I would want to plug somebody in, um, for women, it would, I would plug them into our groups at the transitional home. We have them, we just barely got a men's home opened. We'd be plugging them in over there. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. We need our relationship with Christ, but, but we also need, God uses people to, to help us through that stuff. So mm, that's great. Well, thank you all so much. I, I have a feeling we could we could talk about this for for many many hours and and perhaps uh, create an entire podcast uh, around this subject. But I do appreciate you uh, introducing it uh, for our listeners and sharing your own stories and and your own experience. Thank you, thank you, um, and and to those who are listening, uh, we thank you for uh, taking this time and 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 uh, and listening to this conversation today. Uh, I want to encourage you to participate in the conversation. You can uh, find us uh, at, at the link uh, in the description of uh, the video or the podcast. You can find us at calvary.edu and look for uh, Calvary Conversations there. And there's all kinds of information and contact information. Uh, we want you to know that if, if you are dealing with addiction, there is hope in Amen. Christ. And that's that's the ultimate thing we want you to hear is that there's hope in Christ and uh, anything that we could do to help you, uh, we would love to do that. So thank you for joining us. Uh, grace and peace. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Calvary Conversations, a service of Calvary University in Kansas City, Missouri. We invite you to participate in the conversation by contacting us through the Calvary University website, calvary.edu, or by calling us at 816 816- 322-0110. Join us again next week for another Calvary Conversation.